good evening and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I know at the middle of the week, Thursdays gets a little rough. I've had a, a week and a half uh, in just the last three or four days, so I know what it's like. Also, those of you who are in school and studying, things of that nature, uh, Thursdays come to a head, and I just can't wait till the weekend hits. Uh, we're going to uh, start tonight. I want to keep you standing uh, so we can uh, go through the passage tonight. Please turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 4. And we're going to go, uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 13. I'll read and just follow along. <clears throat> My Bible calls this uh, section, Security and Wisdom. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, Let your heart retain my words. Keep my commands and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Hear, my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths, and when you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. You may be seated. So like I said, I... I I titled tonight's message, The Way of Wisdom. It was a great song back in the 80s. Um, and it, it, it talked about all the wisdom literature. And uh, so I figured it'd be a little kind of catchy. So, Errol's challenged the, uh, the elders and the deacons to uh, always have something ready. And sometimes we're ready, and sometimes we're not. So he says, you know, don't, don't sweat it. What you need to do, he goes, well, how is the Lord speaking to you? Um, whether it's in uh, discipleship, whether it's in your quiet time, um, or even in a sermon that, that he's preached or something you've heard on the radio, has he, has he spoken to your heart? Don't just try to conjure something up. Because right away, when I'd be challenged in the past to do a teaching or a reading, or not a reading, a teaching or a Bible study, I'd go right to uh, the commentaries, and I'd break out like 10 books, and I'd, you know, sweat for a month, you know, and lay stuff out. But I took his, adv his, his advice to heart, and he actually gave us a, kind of a, an outline years ago. Um, never really looked at it. I mean, I did. I never really looked at it after we had the class. But it's just so simple. It lays it out for you. So this, is, um, this passage, I, I was in Proverbs uh, recently, and this passage really spoke to me. So have you ever had to assemble something or been given a task to do something that required following instructions? And before you took it, or took it, took it on or started a project. We have a lot of guys here in our church that love to barbecue. They love grilling and smoking, and, and I are one of them because I love meat. My wife knows how much I love this. And being the thoughtful and loving person she is, she uh, oftentimes gets me gifts for my outdoor grilling and things like that. Over the years, she's given me utensils, meat thermometers, barbecue covers, and even spices and rubs. About two years ago, she gave me a barbecue tent cover. First of all, I never knew there was such a thing. What the heck is that? Um, but when I saw the picture on the box, I thought, man, that, that looks pretty cool. Had a metal frame, had side shelves, hooks, utensils, a bottle opener, and a wind, wind resistant like a canopy, which was very cool. It even has little straps for hanging lights so you can barbecue at night, which I love to do. Uh, I seriously thought I, I died and went to barbecue heaven. <laughs> Anyways, when it came time to assemble it, I took out all the parts. I laid them all out, 
looked at all the pictures and quickly scanned some of the instructions. I think it said somewhere on the box that the assembly would take about 45 minutes or so. So, cool. And I started early enough in the afternoon <clears throat> that I'd be done in time for grilling that evening. Well, the first part of the project was basically building the cage, which required connecting four sides together by sliding corner poles into each other and then screwing them tight. Each corner pole had a letter on it, A, B, C, and D. So I connected them alphabetically which made perfect sense. I did that like in 20 minutes or so because there were so many screws. It took a while. But it stood up perfectly straight. It didn't rock, nothing. It was, it was right on money. So I figured I'm halfway done. However, when it came time to fasten the shells, I noticed that the screw holes on the poles didn't line up with the bottle opener, uh, with the shelves. Uh, everything was facing outside if I would have connected it the way I hooked it up. And I would have had a shelf with no other pole to hold it. So I went back to the instructions and I looked at all the pictures again. And everything looked to me. Everything looked right. And then uh, I noticed something on the pole assembly. I was about to lose my gas, blow a gasket. <clears throat> it said, connect A to F. Connect D to C. And well, basically had to do the whole thing all over again. With several screws lost and found in the process. They never give you extra screws. That really kind of takes me off. By the time I finished, I was so frustrated um, that I didn't barbecue that night. So Liz ordered uh, Chinese food that night. <laughs> Saved. Now, you're probably thinking, what in the world am I getting at? What is this guy talking about? Many people struggle with growing in grace because they have not read the instructions. I'm not saying that the Bible is merely an instruction book. But it is sort of a manual for believers, and without it, we're going to eat a lot of Chinese food and no barbecue. Um, in this passage, the father is teaching his children about a vitally important, about how vitally important it is to get wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. This is the, the Lord telling us, his children, how important it is to have wisdom, his knowledge, how important it is to have his wisdom, his knowledge, and his understanding. Many Christian leaders believe that the biggest problem in the church today is a lack of discernment, a lack of viewing the world and life in general through biblical eyes, to have what we are often encouraged here at Grace Bible, a Christian worldview. So the first, I'm gonna, there's four parts in this. The first one is give attention. So I'm going to go back to verse 1. Here are my children the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. There's a difference between hearing and listening, isn't there? We hear a variety of sounds throughout the day. Music and people talking, cars honking, uh, really cool tunes on the radio sometimes, even good studies. But when you listen, you are tuned in. You ever been working on a project and there's, you know, chatter, noise in the background. Even here when we do the work days, you're concentrating on something that has to be done right, and you're hearing all this chatter, all this stuff around, but you're still zeroed in on that one thing. So when you're listening, you're, you're, uh, you're tuned in. It's being attentive. A person who wants your attention wants you to listen to what they have to say to you. Nothing irks me more than when I'm talking to somebody, and they ask me something, and I'm responding, and they talk right over me. I said, well, why didn't you ask me the question? You already know the answer. Being talked over, uh, or when, when you know somebody's not paying any attention to you, they're just kind of glazing off, especially at work, when you're working on a project. But when you give somebody their attention, you're looking at them eye to eye. Ask yourself, do I listen for the voice of God when I hear his word preached or taught? Am I asking him for understanding? Or am I just sitting through services and studies because I know it's the right thing for a Christian to do? And if by chance I get something out of it, great. Bring it even closer home. Am I listening to this guy right now? Do I only listen or tune into sermons, sermons and teachings that I think apply to me? Or is my goal to receive the whole counsel of God? i got to tell you, before I had kids, 
If there was a sermon that dealt with parenting, I kind of, sort of listened because I thought it didn't really apply to me at the time. Never mind, I was working with their children, children in our church, in the youth group, and I was a counselor at youth camp and Sunday school. I did trips to uh, Mexico, Tecate, and Tijuana, and a lot of bilingual stuff. I was with kids. Even if it wasn't directly working with children, aren't local bodies also considered families? And don't we look out for one another? Especially when trials or tough times come. We're like the parents of the, you know, you're not going to go beat some kid, somebody's kid that is running down the hallway. But I mean, we, we collectively look after each other. We used to do um, dedications. Well, we don't do that anymore, but there was something behind that. Uh, where it talked about uh, that we'd stand with the families. And it's kind of a cool thing. I remember uh, one young man that I discipled years ago. We were at some family gathering, with family and friends. I don't think there was much church folk there. But the way he referred to me or even introduced me, he called me his spiritual mentor. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm in, he's in my discipleship group. But I knew what he meant, because he didn't have a father who was a believer. He had a father, but the man was not a believer. Now, I wasn't assuming the role of the young man's dad, but the Lord apparently used me at that time to be the adult male in this young man's life that he could turn to for spiritual counsel. You never know when God is going to use you for something. Ah, who cares? I mean, I don't have any kids. Or, you know what? Uh, I'm not old yet. No, but there's older people that you're around. Can you interact? Some of you young people, can you interact with the old as well as the young? Are you past a certain age where you don't even want to talk to little kids anymore? When I go to parties and gatherings, that's my wife. I always glom on to the old folks. I mean the gray heads, because I want to know, I want to hear the, the wisdom of the sages, you know, from yesteryear. When I first started um, working as a probation officer, <clears throat> there was about, I don't know, a handful of us that were hired on after like 15 years of no hires. So we were younger than anybody there by 15 years. But even those guys that were 15 years older than me, I didn't hang with them. I went to the old dudes because I wanted to learn probation from guys that had been around 20, 30, and 40 years. I wanted to know what it was like. I'd go to lunch with them. You know, we had, I think we went to barbecue on Thursdays. We went to spaghetti on Mondays and then sandwiches on Tuesdays because I wanted to get a good sound basis for what I was doing. I mean, I, I chose a profession that um, I wanted to learn from the best. And um, the young guys would go, what are you hanging out with those old dudes for? Because I want to learn. I know, you know, they, they worked in the 50s and the 60s. That doesn't apply anymore. But it, it did. It did. It gave me a really sound foundation for, for working. So we need to be well-rounded when it comes to... Um, Gathering wisdom, not gathering, gaining wisdom in, uh, in the church family. Because, again, we don't know when and how the Lord's going to use us. Now, the whole counsel of God is something all Christians should aspire to know. You never know what's going to come in your life. Maybe a death, an illness, somebody real close to you. You don't know how you're going to be used. And every, every area of... Um, of life in some way, shape, or form the Lord talks about. That's what Timothy says in uh, chapter 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable <clears throat> for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So my encouragement here is this. Listen to all that God has to say about everything. The world's screaming at us 24-7. But listen to the Lord's voice every time you're at a gathering of believers. Every time you open the book at quiet time. Anytime you're with somebody in discipleship, home fellowship. If the voice of God is speaking to you in any way, shape, or form, have those ears. Listen. Have that heart open to listen to him. And like Errol says, our pastor, guess what? He is right about everything all the time. We are called to be disciples of the living God, disciplined ones, set apart to follow Christ. 
Ask yourself a few of these questions. Do I seek to hear his voice at every gathering of believers? Do I seek to hear his voice when I hear good preaching on the radio or a podcast? Even bad preaching. Because your antennas go up, right? You know, the older you get, the more you know, hey, something off about that. So you need to be attentive. Don't just say, oh, this guy's a Christian guy. He, he preaches and he's this great stuff. I got a, a text the other day by a, a relative of mine and, oh, man, this guy's a powerful preacher and this and that and the other. And I'm going, yeah, but listen to the substance. It's not there. So quiet time, uh, times when you're listening to the radio or podcasts, all that stuff. Have open ears. Have an open heart. Uh, the next session is get wisdom. So I'm going to just read verse 5 with a little emphasis on, on the get wisdom part. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget it, nor turn away from the words of my mouth. So I'm concentrating on that first part of uh, verse 5. Now this isn't just saying, get smart or wise up, you knucklehead. That's in the Greek. I found that the word wisdom is packed with meaning. One dictionary defines wisdom, and hold on because there's a lot here, as the ability or result of an ability to think and to act, utilizing knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, and insight. I've heard respected Christian pastors, including our own, refer to wisdom as simply, for a Christian, knowledge applied. And I think that's short and sweet, but it's to the point. And of course, the wisdom that that we're referring to here is what I'm talking about, uh, godly wisdom, what we get from, the, from God's Word. It's a funny thing about being a parent, especially when your kids get older, and they're too, too young, I mean, they're too old to be taught like little kids. Uh, because I said so, it doesn't cut it anymore. And as time goes on, uh, they sometimes start questioning your wisdom, and your insight, and they have strong opinions of their own. And that, that's a good thing, as long as they listen to you. However, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard parents of young adults say about their kids uh, after the kids went through some trial or, or some, some tough deal, some difficulty. They, they say stuff like, Mom or Dad, how did you know that was going to happen? Or how did you know about that? And the answer from the parents is usually something like this. Because I've been around for a long time. I may not know everything, but I have life experience. And this isn't the first time I've seen this. This ain't my first rodeo. In my experience, when this happens, the result usually, and you can fill in the blanks. Those of us who have been around for a while, some more than others, judging by our hair, you know, we, 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 we know certain things, we, know, we have common sense, we have experience, but if your common sense and your experience is drawn from Scripture, all the better. All the better. You can, you can point people, and seriously point people in the right direction. The more you experience God's truth from His Word, the more godly knowledge you have to grow in His grace and impart knowledge to others. You may not realize it, right away anyway, but the more time you spend in God's Word, the wiser you will be as a believer. It sounds so simple and so like, oh, no, no duh. But don't just gloss over when you're reading. Now, you can't study every time you're reading. Sometimes you have to get your quiet time. No, I'm not going to say, I was going to say out of the way. Sometimes you want to get your quiet time in, and you know you have a day. you got to rush out. Maybe you stayed out too late the night before. So sleep is a good thing. But take the time to really ponder the words of God when you read them. Especially when you're reading through the wisdom books, you know, Proverbs, uh, Psalms, of course. But even the narratives. You can glean so much from just, just the narratives in the Bible. So let's, um, let's turn uh, to the first chapter in Proverbs and follow along. I'm going to start reading in, in verses... Uh, from verse 2. This is about three verses. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive to receive instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. To give 
prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A, a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an, and an enigma. Kind of a tongue twister. Enigma is basically something obscure or difficult to understand. The words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. And all you got to do is open the paper. A lot of foolish people listening to the wisdom of the world, which is no wisdom at all. Okay, so some questions for this section. <clears throat> do I have a proper, reverent fear of God? Or has my attitude about God become too familiar, too casual, or possibly even a little flippant? Do I strive to live the Christian life He has ordained for me? Do I know His Word well enough that I critically think through biblical eyes when I'm going through a trial or a challenge? Some of you people here have been through some horrendously sad and, and tough times. You've lost loved ones even in the last three or four years, five years. What held you together? I mean, as a believer, we go to God, don't we? And then there's different things. There's things with, uh, with work, with school, um, decisions you have to make, life decisions. Do you critically think through those? Through biblical eyes. Do we have that Christian worldview that... Uh, that prompts us through this life? Or are we just coasting and then getting a little church now and then? And I stand convicted there, because I did that, I did that for a while. Nobody does these things per perfectly all the time. But there's no excuse for being spiritually lazy, as we're often uh, reminded. We all have different areas of weakness, and it's important to know which area in your spiritual life needs attention. Getting God's wisdom is key to so many things. Being in His Word. Our next section is, do not depart from it. I'm going to read the second, well, I'll read the whole of verse 5. It's emphasis on the second part. It says, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget, nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Here the second part of verse 5 says, do not forget nor turn away. In verse 6, it says, do not forsake her, speaking of wisdom. And then down in verse 13, it says, take firm hold of instruction and do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. These are strong admonitions to believers. We're not to stray or worse, worse yet, turn our backs on God's wisdom. Choosing anything that is in opposition to the word of God is never the right choice even when his choice, even when the way he's supposed to do it is, is tough. But sadly, we do this from time to time. <clears throat> Proverbs 3, 1 through 4 says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. The passage really spoke to me one morning about uh, when I read it two weeks ago. Because it demonstrated powerfully, I think, that God wants to bless his children. What parent doesn't want the best for his kids? Our supreme father in heaven obviously wants the best for us. And he's given us a playbook, so to speak, to know him and to, and to delight in doing his will. Knowing God so well that even when the tough times come and you know you want to stay in His will and you've got to do something tough because that's what the Lord said to do according to His word, not just some bad chili dog you had the night before. It's tough. It's tough going through those those uh, valleys sometimes. But if, you, if you're in tune with God's word, you know that doing the tough things sometimes, it's the right thing to do and you're pleasing your Father in heaven. These marching orders God gives us are not complicated. They're actually fairly simple. Um, 
but they're not easy to do on a consistent basis. Sometimes we're trekking along just great, aren't we? And then something comes up and we, we dip down. I don't know about you guys, but my my walk for years was peaks and valleys. It was it was it's supposed to be a, a, a slow trajectory with a blip here and there, and you're supposed to be hopefully you're going forward and you're going upward, onward and upward, as they say. But I had uh, so many challenges as a young believer. I had so much religion in my past. I had uh, so much of what I thought was uh, worldly wisdom. Uh, I don't know what I thought. I knew I loved the Lord, but I still went through a lot of a lot of pain and, and nonsense because I didn't stay in tune with His Word. I would do my readings and then I'd go on with my day, but it wasn't consistent. So it's not easy to do on a, on a regular and consistent basis. Seriously, if you're a Christian, who it, it's it's a simple concept. Who here doesn't know that the more you read God's Word, the more you'll know about what He wants and how He wants you to live. God wants to give you the abundant life. And we're not talking about financial benefits or, or worldly goods. God wants to bless you and give you contentment and peace, His Word says. If He blesses you with something tangible, that's great. But don't seek to do His will to gain favor with Him. It doesn't work anyway. You, you can't kiss up to God. He knows your heart. So... And definitely don't do it to, to grow your bank account. He's already given you the greatest gift, his son. And as our pastor often says again, your sins are forgiven. What can be better than that? We don't need to fear anything this side of salvation. We know where we're going to ultimate glory with him. When the world and everything it has to offer will be no more. So don't strive after this world. And again, this is a lot of familiar stuff, but... We need to be reminded. Our Father has ordained that if we seek to do His will by living according to His word, we will enjoy the abundant life and His peace. Does it mean life will be free and easy? We just get to coast in the glory? Of course not. Just think about all the martyrs who did not depart from God. They were obedient to the end. Some may be thinking right now, Wow, Augustine, this is, this is a little heavy. It's kind of extreme. Don't be a martyr. Well, many of us, and I've had the privilege of being at the bedsides of several faithful brothers and sisters who remained faithful to the end. And to the person, none of them sought wealth or prosperity, but all of them enjoyed God's peace in the end when he finally called them. And some of these saints had bodies riddled with illness and pain. They were suffering. A few of the people I knew didn't have much at all. Quite done. Uh, not quite poverty, but nothing. Some more questions to ponder about uh, this section. Some of us have been here have been walking with the Lord for a long time, and others only for a short while. For us old timers, do I still love God with the fervency I once had when I was first saved? Or have I forgotten my first love in Christ? Am I content just going to church, trying to live a moral life? A lot of Christians settle right there. I'm going to church. I've got good Christian friends. Obeying the Ten Commandments. Are you growing in grace? Are you cooperating, cooperating in the sanctification process that God has laid out for all of us? He's prepared good works for us. He wants you to know him more and more intimately. And that only happens by you having your nose in God's word. And, of course, prayer. For those who have been, uh, say, more recently, am I content with just having made it into the kingdom? Ah, I got baptized. I'm saved. I'm good. Cool. It's, coast, it's coasting time. Can I coast for a little while? I don't think anyone would actually say these things, but check your attitude about your salvation. Am I purposeful about growing in God's grace by studying and meditating on his word? I love that in discipleship, we do the word hand. Who knows it? Hearing, reading, studying. Yeah, memorizing and meditating. Yeah. 
get, getting that grip on God's word. This is all part of the sanctification process in the Christian life. And we really do need to cooperate with the with the Holy Spirit in this. We, we need to be purposeful about this. I'm not talking about writing a purpose-driven anything. We need to be purposeful. Okay, last part. All right, right thank you. Thank the Lord. Verse 12, the benefits of godly wisdom. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. I'll read 13 too. Take firm hold, firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her for she is your life. This, word, this verse, um, verse 12, tells us if we walk, our steps won't be hindered. And when you run, you won't stumble. What does it mean to be hindered? It's to be impeded, to be obstructed, to be blocked. To hinder is to create difficulties for someone or something. Now, there are a lot of a lot of things that can hinder us in this life, and oftentimes the things that hinder us the most excuse me, are things we wholeheartedly give ourselves to. Think about that. I know the areas in my life that messed me up there. Yeah, I know it's it's God's Word and what it says about this kind of stuff, but I really want to watch this movie. This movie I probably shouldn't be watching. Or, yeah, I know I'm supposed to forgive him or her, but they burned me so many times. It's going to take a long time for me to get there. Or how about something work-related? I'm not working with that idiot. He's too weird, or he's too loud, or whatever it is. Some complaint you have against somebody. You know, that Christ-like attitude isn't exactly bubbling over. Especially when we say something like, uh, I just hate that person. And then when we reflect on what Jesus said about hating, so... Try to keep yourself from going down that road. I don't be doing that. If we simply consider that this line of thinking may possibly be what's hindering your growth in grace or even stifling your love for God and his word, you're missing out on a host of blessings that he may have for you. Godly wisdom enables us to grow in God's grace, but it also gives us godly discernment. I remember when I was a young Christian, I used to pray, Oh God, please... Give me this gift of discernment so that I'll know false doctrine and untruth when I hear it. That's a good thing to pray for, I guess. But I discovered later, through uh, sitting on a good preaching and teaching, that this so-called gift is given only to people who roll up their sleeves, who aren't spiritually lazy, and who put in the time, namely in studying his word. Some of you might remember the last time I, I taught on uh, Thursday night, my study was the Word of God, and one of the sections was knowing God's will by knowing His Word. That's straight out of uh, discipleship, by the way. We are to diligently seek God's will through a dedicated study of His Word. You have to question if someone claims Christianity and has no desire to read, read the Bible. Now, does it mean if you don't read the Bible, you're not a Christian? If He saved you, He saved you. But you're, you're missing out on so much. And he wants to grow you in grace. There are countless benefits of, of attaining godly wisdom in addition to the peace, joy, and contentment we receive. We can be ready in every season to witness to the lost. We can counsel a brother or sister who is going through trials and difficulties. We can keep fellow believers accountable in a loving manner, of course. You don't want to be bashing them with the Bible. That's not what this is about. It should never be our goal to attain the wisdom of God through his word so we can lord it over others. That's another That's another thing that I experienced in my early life. <clears throat> there was a few of those kind of people in my life. For one thing, you're, if you're truly a student of God's word, you know, someone who's real bragocious because they know so much, if he's really a student of God's word, his word says, certainly every man at his best, is but a vapor. Psalm 39, 5b. There's no room for boasting in the body of Christ. The bottom line here is that we can be used by God for his kingdom. How can a person who's been forgiven of their sins not want that for their life? 
don't have that been there, done that attitude. Oh, I, I've been through discipleship. Oh, yeah, I've read the Bible in one year. It's, it's a life process. I mean, think of people like Dr. Sproul uh, or Dr. MacArthur or countless others, Jay Packer, and all the years they, they sunk in to, to reading God's Word. It, and these guys are 70, 80 plus years old. For a Christian, there's no retiring. When we consider that in our natural state, before we knew God or even had a care for his word, when we consider that we are dead in our sins, there was nothing we could do about it. Remember the passage. But God, who was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, you know the rest. By grace you have been saved. Don't forget that verse. So my challenge tonight is obvious, is an obvious one, I hope. Grow in godly wisdom by and through the careful study of his word. Don't be flippant about reading God's word. If you're not in the mood, maybe set it down, pray, and, and get yourself in the mood. Because you need his knowledge, you need his wisdom to get you through this life. There's nothing more important in this world than knowing the will and wisdom of God for godly living and to grow in your love for him. And again, I ask, who knows if God may want to use you for the growth or the good of his kingdom? Ask yourself and be honest, because you can't, you really can't lie to yourself, and you certainly can't lie to God. Am I doing all I can to get the wisdom of God that he desires for all his children. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we do thank you, Lord, for giving us your precious word. We thank you for your precious Holy Spirit who prompts us and prods us along, Lord, at times when we're and those doldrums of our spiritual walk, Lord. We know where to go to get your wisdom, Father. Give us the energy, Lord. Give us that, that nudge we need, Father, if we have grown lazy, Lord, to partake of your word as often as it is possible, Lord. When we gather at functions, when we gather for Sundays and Thursday nights, Lord, when we listen to podcasts and Sermons on the radio, Lord, when we're having our quiet time. When we're watching a spiritually based movie or a documentary, Lord. Help us to see this world through your eyes, Lord. Help us to grow in grace, Lord. Help us to cooperate with that sanctification process that every one of us is going through until we're glorified with you. Lord God in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. God bless and keep all of these people here, Father, and uh, continue your grace upon our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.